All right. Good morning. Let me flip on the mic here and see if this is all working. An ultrasound fellowship is actually a technology fellowship, and my bag has more accoutrements in terms of wires and connection ports. Uh, so that's actually what an ultrasound fellowship is for anybody who wants to know. It's just how to hook up your Mac to uh, to an audiovisual system. But no, so um, thank you all very much for the opportunity to come here. I really enjoy this. And uh, I love seeing medical students. I love teaching residents. And this is just a wonderful opportunity. So I do need to have a, I have a disclosure, right? Most people skip over the slide, no disclosures. I do own an ultrasound consulting company, albeit very small. Uh, but this lecture is not going to be used for any sort of profit. And in fact, uh, it's going to be used by the Medical Student Committee for Education. But let's, we'll just put that out there. And uh, again, thank you to each of you for the opportunity to be here. And who helped put this together? I just see hands of the whole committee. Thank you very much. There is so much behind the scenes work that goes into these things. And it's just uh, wonderful to see. So a little bit about my background. So I did go to medical school at UT San Antonio. And at the time, there was not a lot of ultrasound use. There wasn't a residency program there at the time like there is now. And so my experience with ultrasound didn't start really until residency. And I had the fortune of going to Chicago to Advocate Christ Medical Center, which was one of the pioneering institutions of emergency ultrasound. And so what I want to do for this talk is actually talk to you about where ultrasound came over the last 20 years, where we're at today, and what your careers are going to look like with ultrasound. So like a lot of things in medicine, there's usually one case, one or two cases, that really start to propel changes in medicine. So back in the mid-90s, I believe it was 95 or 96, uh, at Advocate Christ Medical Center on the south side of Chicago, there was a young woman who came in in cardiac arrest. And a young woman presenting in cardiac arrest, um, there's a few things on your differential that really go to the top of the list. And this was not a trauma. She was a found down outside and came into the department. And one of the things at the top of your differential is a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Uh, but that can be hard to diagnose in a person who's in cardiac arrest in front of you. And so at the time, uh, Dr. Mike Lambert was the attending physician there. And he was my ultrasound director during residency, and he's still up there to this day. And he's really one of the unsung heroes of emergency ultrasound. He trained the current generation of leaders in ultrasound. And the device you see there on the right side of the screen uh, may not have been the exact device, but I, I'm told it looked like a refrigerator on wheels. And this was one of the first portable ultrasound machines. And they brought it to the bedside of this young woman who was in cardiac arrest. And again, this, this had not been done before in an emergency department, and it was only 20 years ago. And I, I, they got an image that looked something like this. Now, you may have seen images like this before, especially on trauma rotations where we're looking for fluid in the abdomen. This is a FAST exam. So you see the liver, the kidney, and the lower portion of the screen, and there's a black stripe of fluid right in the middle, and that's blood. So in a young woman in cardiac arrest with blood in her abdomen, uh, with, with not 100% certainty, but, but approaching that, uh, she was dying of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And they were able to resuscitate her, and they got her to the operating room in a matter of minutes, and she survived neurologically intact. And so this really, this foundational case, when they were able to save this young woman's life, uh, took ultrasound in its infancy and propelled it uh, throughout the past 20 years to where we are today. And so this was one of the pioneering institutions where some of the research started, where a lot of the leaders came out of. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the background. So when you, when you look back over where, where we're at today, you know, there has just been a tremendous amount of work that has gone into getting ultrasound machines just to the bedside. It doesn't sound like a big deal. You would think, well, look, this is a good technology or patients need it. What's, what's the, you know, what, where, is the, uh, where are the roadblocks? But there are a number of roadblocks and there are many people that have just done uh, hours and hours of work to get where we are today. This is a list of where we're at today. And this is not a comprehensive list. Uh, this is about 15 or 16 items. So we use ultrasound for almost every procedure you can think of. We use it to resuscitate the sick and critically ill. We use it in trauma. We use it to look at the aorta, the kidneys, the gallbladder, the heart, the lungs, the eyes. If it's a body part, you can probably look at it with ultrasound. Uh, and there's a lot more to come. Research is being done in stroke. Research is being done in, in musculoskeletal. Uh, and even transesophageal uh, cardiac ultrasound imaging is, is, is uh, coming of age. I want to show you just, you can't have an ultrasound lecture without good pictures and videos. So uh, I want to show you a couple interesting pictures. 
On the left side of the screen is the right lower quadrant of a patient's abdomen, and there's a tubular structure that has a blind end to it. Uh, it was very tender when you compressed it, and it's dilated to 1.2 uh, centimeters, and that's the appendix. So this is acute appendicitis. Um, on the right side of the screen, you have a much, more, uh, a much sicker patient. This was a young lady who came in in cardiac arrest. Uh, I'm sorry, not cardiac arrest. She was near arrest, but she was having chest pain and dyspnea and was tachycardic and hypoxic. And this is a four-chamber view of the heart, and uh, the right ventricle is severely dilated. And this is from an acute pulmonary embolus. And unfortunately, she didn't survive this, uh, but it did help us at least diagnose and attempt to resuscitate her sooner than we would have otherwise been able. Um, what are the benefits of ultrasound? I mean, why, why is this perfect for emergency medicine? It is rapid, so it does not take that long to do. It takes a matter of minutes. It's repeatable, so if something changes, you can reassess the patient. And most importantly, it's portable. A lot of our patients are just often too sick to go to leave the department, to go to CT. And so you bring this to the patient. Um, it spares some of the uh, untoward effects of CT, so there's no contrast and there's no radiation. It improves procedural safety. It improves patient throughput, meaning they spend less time in the emergency department if they're going to be discharged. And it improves patient satisfaction. So I want to show you this case. This is an interesting case, and this was not a critically ill patient. But this really exemplifies the benefits of ultrasound that I just listed. So on the left side of the screen is the posterior oropharynx, a female patient who came in with a bad sore throat. And you can see that the patient's left side of the posterior oropharynx is very swollen, and the uvula is deviated to the right. And these are classic findings for a peritonsal or abscess. On the right side of the screen is Dr. Jeremy Smith. He was my fellowship director, and he's letting me put an endocavitary probe in his mouth to demonstrate using an endocavitary probe uh, to, to localize this abscess and to drain it. I will tell you, though, that there, if you're going to use the endocavitary probe, uh, which is generally used for, for pelvic ultrasounds, there has to be a cover on it. And in residency, we just unroll Trojans. I would recommend you use a dedicated probe cover because if you unroll the Trojan in front of the patient, you just get funny looks. But nonetheless, patients will let you do this. And uh, so that's the, that's the endocavitary probe going into Dr. Smith's mouth. And this is a video, and it's not showing up, uh, it's a little bit dull, but you can basically see it. There is a round circle of fluid in the center of the screen, and this was about 15 mLs of pus. So imagine how painful it would be to take a syringe full of pus and inject it in the back of your throat. And that's what these patients have. It's terribly painful. So you can see a little bit. You see a, a hyperechoic line coming in from the upper left side of the image, and that's a needle. So you can take the probe, and you can take a needle, and you can watch the needle go into the abscess cavity and drain it. One of the reasons that uh, peritonsillar abscess aspirations aren't done by all emergency physicians is because just beyond that sucker lives your internal carotid artery. And so there's a little bit of hesitancy to blindly put a needle into an abscess cavity that you're not sure the depth of and you're not quite sure where the internal carotid artery lives at. But with ultrasound, you can, see, you can see everything. You can see the artery pulsating, you can see the abscess, and you can watch your needle go into the abscess. So here's a before and after picture. So on the left side of the screen was the abscess cavity before, and on the right hand, it's resolved. And this was 15 milliliters of pus that was taken uh, from her posterior oropharynx. So what does this mean? This patient was not critically ill, but she was extremely happy and felt a lot better. She didn't have to have a CT scan. She didn't have to have a needle poked blindly into the back of her throat. She didn't have to be incised with an 11 blade by a surgeon. She got an ultrasound, one needle poke, and it was gone. So this really exemplifies, you know, all the benefits of bedside ultrasound. What else is going on in ultrasound today? Well, it is a residency requirement. Um, it is, uh, right now, currently, most programs are going to require, at minimum, 150 ultrasound scans. Uh, our program is 300, which seems to be a more common number. So you are literally going to do hundreds of ultrasounds in your residency, and you should, because it's critically important to your future. Uh, if you choose to do it, if you want to do a fellowship, there, is, uh, there are a lot to choose from. There's over 100 currently, and there's a map there on the right side of the screen about where they're distributed. Uh, it's a one-year fellowship. It's a great way to just enhance your care. I enjoy doing it because it didn't take me away from the bedside. It really just enhanced, uh, I think, my skill set as an emergency physician. The industry is finally coming around to supporting this. For years and years, it took uh, uh, a lot of pleading 
to the manufacturers of the machines to give some attention to this market. And they're finally doing it. The machines are really catching up to speed. There are software solutions to help integrate this into the patient care record. Uh, and that really brings me to my next point. These studies, um, I'm of the opinion that by the time you all are done training or early in your career, pretty much everywhere, these are going to be integrated into the, the medical record. Uh, we've gotten them at JPS onto PACS, so they sit right next to all the other imaging studies of the patient. Uh, a lot of other healthcare systems are, are doing the same thing. And so I anticipate this is just going to be a, a nationwide a continuum. And so probably by the end of your training or earlier in your career, you know, these studies are going to be a part of the patient healthcare record. Back in the day, they were just printed off on a piece of paper, paper clipped to the patient chart, and probably nobody ever saw them again. But these have a lot of value, and so there's a good reason to keep these into the patient chart, and I think we're going to see that continue to increase. Um, there's an accreditation program now through ASEP called the Clinical Ultrasound Accreditation Program. So as an emergency department, you can be accredited by ASEP in point of care ultrasound, and there is robust research. It, it amazes me every day how much research goes into this. This is a, just a, a smattering of examples of, of modern machines, um, all the way from cart-based to some handheld options. Um, and these are continue, going, going to continue to get more portable and improve image quality. And, uh, and, and the technology is phenomenal. So it, it really is going to continue to, to get even better. What do you all have to look forward to for your next 30 years of your career? Because um, it's going to go by quick. Uh, I guarantee you this is going to continue to expand. Guarantee you. The medical schools are getting on board. How many of y'all have had ultrasound education in medical school? That's like the whole room. Has it, and outside of an emergency medicine rotation, who's had ultrasound education? All right. So this isn't the next 30 years. This should have said present. Um, this is going to continue to increase. The more we get medical students educated to this, the more skills you're going to bring to residency and the better you're going to be and the more quickly you're going to acquire these skills. Uh, the machines are going to get better and better. They're going to get more portable and they're going to develop higher resolution. Again, they're going to become integrated into the patient's healthcare record and uh, I'm of the opinion that this is going to be an expectation of your uh, future employers and groups. There's so much value in this, both to your patients, quality of care, and to cost savings that there is no way this, this can't be on their radar screen. And interestingly, I suspect your patients are going to begin to expect this. I'm going to show you an interesting slide here uh, of what I mean by that. This is a diagram. Uh, did everybody get a copy of this so we can really dive into this? I'm just kidding. Um, this is just a diagram of, of what we do behind the scenes trying to integrate. How do you get an ultrasound image at the bedside into the patient's medical record? Again, it sounds like it should be easy, but there's a lot of complexities to it. But the hospitals are beginning to have these conversations and accomplish these goals of getting it wirelessly into the patient's record. So you'll be seeing that more and more. There was a journal article. This was not a clinical journal. This was a healthcare finance and management journal a couple of years ago that discussed the value of bedside ultrasound. So this is on the radar screen of, of hospital administrators and physician administrators. And again, this is why I say it's going to be an expectation. You want to go to a residency program where you're going to get very well trained in this. And why do I say patients are going to expect it? Did anybody see these commercials uh, from one of the, the leaders in, um, in machine sonocyte? Did anybody see these commercials like 2014? These are screenshots from commercials that were on TV. Uh, I, think one, I think the top one was even during the Super Bowl. Um, where the company was marketing point of care ultrasound to the consumers, directly to the patients. And as this becomes more and more mainstream, I anticipate your patients in the emergency department are going to look at you as they did in the uh, bottom right one and say, Doctor, are you going to use ultrasound for that central line? Doctor, do I need a CT scan of my neck? Um, so I anticipate this is going to be something your patients are going to ask about. So in summary, bedside ultrasound is here to stay. It is not going anywhere and it's going to continue to get better and better day by day. It improves patient care and quality. It improves your throughput of your patients in the department and it improves your patient's experience in the emergency department. Uh, it is critically important to your, your residency training. Um, so just be aware of that as, as you look around. Uh, the technology is going to, just like anything in the technology world, it's going to continue to, to skyrocket in terms of its ability to resolve the image and really be portable. Uh, your scans will again be a part of the patient healthcare record and others will, uh, this will be an expectation that you'll need to integrate into your practice. So regardless of whether you do a fellowship, just expect that the, the basics of ultrasound are going to be a part of your practice for years to come. All right, those are my kids. 
They are hopefully having breakfast. <laughs> Any questions? No questions? Right. Yeah? Uh, just as a medical student going into residency, how do you recommend just increasing your clinical skill? And you know, how, to, how did you sort of d develop that through your residency and then also in your fellowship? Sort of yeah, fellowship? so there's, there's really two components to ultrasound. There's acquiring the image, mm -hmm. which is more of a technical skill. Mm -hmm. And there's interpreting the image, mm -hmm. and you can you can't separate those two. Uh, we can teach the room with a lecture how to interpret the images, and you can be really good. But until you put the probe on the patient, you have you know the feel of a rib, uh, you know how you're going to navigate bowel gas when you're looking at the aorta. There's all that, there's that whole technical component, and that's where really it just becomes volume, where you have to just um, you you just have to understand its importance so that you take the time to really acquire the skill. Uh, because if your patient's going to be sick, it's very easy, as you all figure out in residency, to just order a CT scan. It takes more time to bring the machine to the bedside. Um, but as you recognize its value to your education, then hopefully you take that time to put the probe on the patient. Because really, that's where the learning is. Good question. All right. Well, thank you all. Hope you enjoy your day.